So uh, thank you, uh, Kaveri, and thank you very much, TJ, for uh, making this uh, meeting uh, possible. Thank you for all the participants uh, joined this. So I will just make a very short and brief introduction. So uh, uh, I was with uh, my wife, Anat, in, uh, in Saranat, I think in January 2014, so a few years ago. And then the, it was uh, TJ and Kaveri with a group of people who were working on the sacred murals, the paintings in the main uh, hall in the center in uh, Nigma, uh, Saranat Indian Nigma Institute, or briefly called the Sini. It was overwhelming beauty that I was created on the walls gradually, step by step. It was the first time I could realize what is the beauty of creating by, by painting. And I was hypnotized by the work of, uh, of Kaveri and TJ. And, uh, and it was also the, uh, in this period, that, this challenging period that uh, I had the feeling, the revival of the feelings from the, from the uh, sacred murals and the, and the Kaveri and TJ immediately accepted the invitation to share the story and bring this uh, sense of feeling of harmony and beauty uh, to share it with us. And it was very much accepted and appreciated by the director of Sini, uh, Tsering Gelek, that she is the youngest daughter of uh, Tatan Turku Rinpoche, that is the main visionary of, uh, of this place and Enigma uh, organization. So I'm very grateful for Kaveri and TJ to, to share the very special story of the sacred murals. Thank you very much and please. Um, good morning or good evening. <laughs> it's morning for us over here. Um, we are uh, honored and pleased uh, to be able to participate uh, in this uh, Zoom call. And uh, I let Kaveri give you a brief introduction about the, the murals, uh, the Sacred Murals Project. Um, so uh, I'll let you take it from there. He always puts me ahead <laughs> for the talking. <laughs> Um, but the Sacred Murals Project was something that dropped in our lap, literally. Um, you know, Selin Gellick, who is the director of the Institute um, uh, in India, actually sent me a note um, just out of the blue uh, based on something that she, uh, a blog I had written. I think it was one of two blogs that I ever wrote, because I don't really like to write. And uh, she asked me if I would come and paint uh, the temple for her in Sarnath, India. Um, so being born Indian uh, and having the sense of the sacred drummed into us, since we uh, literally come out of the womb, um, I knew I couldn't refuse. Um, so I actually woke up TJ and I said, we're going to Sarna. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's how it all started. Um, but then we went and met with um, Rinpoche. Um, you know, Serene arranged a meeting after she and I had many conversations about what we were going to do. And... Um, her, her interest was interesting because she wanted to do sacred trees of India because in India, the trees are always prayed to, you know, nature is always prayed to. So, of course, you know, we were on board. We were like, okay, it's a landscape, it's trees, not a problem. We can do this, <laughs> you know. Um, but then we met Rinpoche and everything changed. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, I remember asking Sering, Sering wasn't there, she was in India, and I remember asking Sering, you know, how should I prepare, and I remember her laughing and, <laughs> and saying, you can't prepare for Rinpoche, and uh, she was absolutely right. Um, so when we met him, um, 
you know, we talked about doing the sacred trees in the temple for India, you know, all different, you know, sandalwood, mango, because they all mean something within, you know, the religious context and mean something. Um, but I remember sitting there with him and he said, yes, yes, we're going to do the trees, but we are also going to do the life of the Buddha. And this was the first time I'd ever heard of that. And I was like, oh, gulp, you know, <laughs> uh, the life of the Buddha, that's uh, okay. <laughs> you know, there's something about Rinpoche, you just really just can't say no. You know, he has this sense of um, presence, which you just say yes, and and where do I start? <laughs> And so that's that's how it really started. And uh, but it was interesting. I was nervous because I had never really had any previous um, interactions with anything Buddhist. I mean, I grew up Hindu, but uh, and Buddhism was taught. You know, I mean, the story of the Buddha was taught to us in school, but I'd had no other connection. Uh, despite that. Um, and I remember Rinpoche uh, looking at me because I was I was I was like, oh, what should we do? You know, uh, what kind of genre do you want us to paint it in, and what do you want us to do? And I remember him looking at me and saying, "You're Indian. Go home and do it." <laughs> you know, and that was it. Um, so then after that, you know, Saving and I had many conversations, and TJ. Uh, we all sat together and, and we decided that we were going to use as our color palette, um, we were going to use the Indian miniature paintings because the Indian miniature paintings have this very soft sense of watercolor, uh, which is very sensitive. It's very Indian in nature, but it isn't harsh. And one of the directives that Rinpoche had for us was that whoever came into the room, no matter who came from which part of the world, they should feel comfortable. You know, they should be able to stand in the room and feel comfortable. Mm. They have to identify with what was being shown. So keeping that in mind, um, you know, we did something interesting. Uh, we decided to create a natural horizon, which is based on human scale. So we had a um, continuous horizon that went around the room. Um, I don't know if I can show you an image of that. Um, I'll, I'll, I will show you an image of that later, but um, we did it in such a way that wherever you stood, your eye never stopped. And and, and the, the horizontal line of um, the horizon would calm everything down, you know. So when you entered, you'd have the sense of peace. You'd have the sense of stillness in the middle of the room. And um, that's really how we actually, that was our one uh, basic concept was to make everybody feel comfortable. And uh, this image that you're seeing in front of you is interesting because this was the first sentient being that actually entered the hall when we started painting. So if you look down here, um, this is a little bird that flew in and TJ photographed it and it actually tried to sit right here on the bamboo that we had painted. And it kept trying to sit there, got exhausted, and it, it, it sat down on this pallet. And TJ took a picture of it, and, and I painted it right where it was trying to sit. Yeah. So for us, this was a really auspicious moment because it was the first ancient being that flew in. We knew then that, okay, we're on the right path. <laughs> you know, and that uh, everything was coming alive. So I'm going to let TJ talk a little bit now about um, the color palette. 
I don't think we can get to the presentation. Um, I can, I think. Let me see. Zach, we were trying to get to the other PDF. Um, maybe you could pull it up on your screen, I think. Um, yeah, is it possible for you to uh, pull up the other uh, uh, the other document on your screen? Maybe close this down and click from there. Okay. It's it's ironic that it opened on this particular image <laughs> because this is an image uh, that's very dear to me. Um, it is the Mahaparinirvan, uh, which is when the Buddha uh, leaves his physical body. And uh, I don't know if it's up minds me sharing this story. It's up. <laughs> uh, it's up, you're muted. So uh, when uh, when uh, I, I was in, in Sarnath, it was exactly the period that a uh, uh, Kaveri painted a uh, the Buddha's eyes, and I was not able to move for a very long period. It was just magically, she was trying different ways uh, to paint the eyes, and it was just, I was sitting there next to her. She was so much, so deeply uh, concentrated and with her delicate brushes, with so much focus with the, the face of the Buddha and his eyes, and trying different ways and it was, you could feel that the different ways it, it comes to life, different uh, feelings were radiating from his face. And it was for me, one of the most sacred times that I remember, it was so, so amazing. And then uh, to see it when it was completed, it was amazing to see it in full extent. So it's a very blessed, moment in my life, this uh, sitting, viewing a uh, Kaveri painting the Buddha's face or eyes, so. From my perspective, it's a, uh, oh, I think what you and your wife created for me was a moment, uh, you know, we, we were running 30 artists in this hall, so, and they all required attention, you know, they all wanted to, speak to us or get direction, you know. And when I was painting this particular uh, Buddha, uh, I had this intense feeling um, which overwhelmed me. And, and I couldn't stop crying while I was painting. Uh, I don't know what it was that, that that happened to me at that moment in time. And then there was a part of me which was feeling uh, embarrassed because I was crying, you know, and uh, I didn't want anybody to see. Uh, but it was a beautiful open moment where I was connecting to something to very, very deep. And because of Itzak and his wife who were sitting behind me, nobody interrupted the circle. So I really have to thank them for giving me that particular moment in time, which I would not have had if they hadn't been there. So, you know, karma, right? Everything is already written <laughs> as, as we believe, you know. But I, I, you can start from the, yeah. I'm going to start from the top. Um, this, this is the original concept that we put together for the murals. This was a watercolor rendering of what we showed Rinpoche. And um, so, you know, for us, it was important again, as you can see the colors 
Uh, if you are familiar with Indian miniature paintings, you will recognize the colors. And uh, the other thing that was really important for us was that when you looked out of all the windows uh, in the hall, that the color of the sky would be the same as what you saw in India, so that there would not be any difference between the murals that were painted on the inside and the actual sky on the outside. So that we actually did, I'm gonna um, enlarge it a little bit so you can see the very thin glazes of actually pinks. And in India, you know, the, 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 there's always this little film of dust, you know, and that, that's just there from all the agriculture and everything. And it always has this slightly pink hue because the earth there is a little pink. So, so what we did was we actually glazed the entire murals with this very faint, transparent pink. And, and that's what gives it that sort of dreamy quality to the sky. And if you look out in, through the windows, you'll see the sky has the same feeling. It isn't like a clear blue sky. Yeah. And um, the, the, the Buddha itself is, is actually, um, it is, it's called the Sarnath Buddha. And if you look at the hands there, you know, in the Dharma Chakra Mudra, which means that the first wheel of motion has been set. And so it's the teaching mudra. It's the teaching mudra. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to let TJ talk to you about uh, the decorative. Yeah. You know, a lot of the inspiration um, that we got for the decorative elements uh, in the sacred hall were from the Sarnath, uh, the Damak Stupa, which is, you know, it's maybe an, a mile and a half away from there. And it dates back to the third century BC. And uh, they are, it was excavated finally um, by the the English when they were there. And, uh, and we have, you know, um, all the decorative elements come, coming out. So what we did was we took elements of the, um, the decorative elements which are on the stupa now are obviously, they don't have the colors which they originally did have, <clears throat> but we took the forms and, and gave them the uh, colors which are vibrant and present in India. Uh, all around you when you look. So this is how we came up with the the <clears throat> the, the altar uh, decorative. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, and let me show you the actual. <clears throat> this this is the actual hallway. This is yes. <clears throat> and if uh, just to give you a sense of scale. From here to here is about 22 feet. And, and across it's about 45 feet. Um, so, so you can see if I toggle between, between the original concept to what we did, you know, we were fairly true to it. Um, so I'm going to go down to this one. Just, uh, I think to help, because we are using here meters, so yeah. if I'm not wrong, 22 feet, it's about seven meters or six, six and a half meters. Okay. I think you divide it by three more or less. Three, yeah, okay. more or less, three, yeah. So, yeah. yeah exactly. And about 45, it's 45 uh, feet in length. So it's up, how much would that be in meters? Um. <laughs> yeah, that would be... Well. It would be about 14, 15 meters. Right, and it's about... At the center of the hall, it's about forty feet high. Um, just, just to give you, it's about so forty feet. Meters. Oh, amazing! Yeah. Yes. So um, I'm going to go on to this one. This is the wall that is directly across from from the altar wall, uh, and this is what we chose uh, to depict the life of the main events of the life of the Buddha 
and the career you can talk mm -hmm. about in this. I, on this one, we actually had a lot of debate because usually, you know, in any temple, you you won't put your you won't keep your back um, to any deity, you know. So we had a big conversation about it, <laughs> but it was the only place that we could actually do it. So, uh, and, and you know, there was a lot of debate as to how how we should organize it, you know, because there is a traditional way of organizing it, and this was a non-traditional way of organizing it. So Rinpoche gave us the blessing that we could do it on this wall. And so after a lot of discussion, the way we organized it is we figured that we should put, you know, the sum of the teachings, which is, you know, this particular image of the Buddha with his disciples, the five, the, the five original disciples, that we would put it right over the door because we felt that the door was the entrance into the temple and it was the fulcrum you know, for everything. So it was the one, it was the balance point. Um, so so we decided we would keep the teaching panel of the Buddha teaching and setting the first view of Dharma into motion right over the door. And then to the right of it, we did his physical birth. You know, so this is the birth panel. Let me show it to you. This is the birth panel. And right here, you can see these two little pieces of blue tape, which indicates that I'm going to paint the Buddha in here. <laughs> so this this photograph was taken before it was actually complete, mm -hmm. you know. So this is Queen Maya, his mother. This is Brahma, and this is Indra. These are gods. Um, mm -hmm. Then on on the right side, we kept the physical birth. And then on the left side, we kept the spiritual birth. So that is, you know, the enlightenment, when the Buddha got enlightened under the Bodhi tree. And then we organized the bottom two panels as on the right being the physical renunciation of the Buddha when he leaves palace life and becomes an ascetic. And then on the left, we kept, we kept the the actual physical uh, renunciation of his body, you know, which was Mahaparinirvana when he died. Um, so that's how we organized it. And we felt that uh, this felt good. Um, and as and and in the center was the teaching mudra. So his life was like bookends, you know, to the main event in his life where he started the actual dharma in motion so go to this one um, so this is the birth panel and as you can see the buddha is now painted in <laughs> and um you know this within this particular panel we have so many different little pieces of symbolism so for example this pole here um you know with the blue with the blue uh center is um it shows the perfect landscape they call it the perfect landscape and really i think it is based on emptiness teachings you know which um you know which is a separate thing to talk about but they always call this the perfect landscape yeah so the way we organized it is that we kept the gods on one side and uh, everybody else on the other. <laughs> so um, here was Brahma, uh, who, who is the creator in, in, the Hindu, uh, um, in the Hindu mythology. Right, yeah. He is uh, the creator. And then Indra, who is the king of all the gods. So these were the two who were present when the Buddha was born. And as, as you know, uh, this, this is Queen Maya, and the Buddha was born from her side. And when he came into being, he was perfectly formed, and he walked in all the four directions, and uh, wherever he walked, a lotus 
a lotus flower right, sprang up. up. I'm going to maybe go back here so that you can see that. So that's the Buddha and it's going in four directions. And then these are various gods. Um, these are the Naga kings, you know, who are showering him. And these are Pratyeka Buddhas. So when the Buddha was born, um, the, these were beings who were Buddhas, but who only taught by example. They, didn't, they never preached. So when he was born, um, they all burst into flames, actually. And their, their remains fell to the earth. And there was this great peace in this, in this area. And they, that's what they call the deer park. You know, the deer park is actually also called Rishi Patna. Rishi meaning uh, the Pratyeka Buddhas and Patna meaning the soil where they landed. So we, even though the birth of the Buddha was in Lumbani, we did decide to actually show the Pratyeka Buddhas, um, the presence of the Pratyeka Buddhas, because uh, it felt a little bit like I don't know, transfer of power <laughs> or uh, the baton being handed over, you know. Um, so, yeah. So that's what happened. So I am going to go on to this one. So this is on the other side. Um, and this is the Buddha when he got enlightened. Um, it was interesting the way we actually painted, uh, the painted, the actual panels. There was almost a feeling of a natural rhythm in the way that it happened. The first panel that we painted was the birth panel. And the birth panel had a tremendous amount of figures. It was the first panel we painted. It was the longest one to do yeah. and the most difficult <clears> one <throat> to do. And it almost felt like we were giving birth, you know, it it had that feeling, you know. Um, there was a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, just for the lack of a better word, chaos, you know, and and it seemed to be coming into being. Um, then the next one that we actually painted, uh, I'm actually going to go to that first, was this one, which was Palace Life. And w when we painted Palace Life, um, there was everything sort of settled in, you know, um, we were getting into our rhythm of what needed to happen, actually. And, um, this one was, um, you know, our inspiration came from the Ajanta Caves. And there's a very famous um, image of the Bodhisattva um, that is painted in Ajanta. Mm -hmm. And um, and this one was based on that. Um, within this particular um, panel, you know, Rinpoche's, one of Rinpoche's directives to Sering was that everything that we painted in here had to have a sense of feeling. Everything had to have feeling, you know. So even if you notice, um, you can feel the wind in the beads. You know, we wanted to give the feeling that there was, you know, circulation of air. And so we painted the beads in a way that it felt as if the wind was blowing through them. And um, within that, you know, we had the stillness of the Bodhisattva. And as I go into that, you know, here are the Ashoka, Ashoka lions. Now, Ashoka was the emperor under which India was mainly Buddhist. And um, we were actually asked as to why we decided to put these here. And one of the reasons we decided to put them here was when the Buddha was, was a king, he was a Chakravartan king. And a Chakravartan king had certain marks, you know, certain characteristics. And Ashoka was 
considered a Chakravartan king. Mm -hmm. So so we decided to use that symbol. And the symbol has a lot of meaning because it also is now presently a symbol that exists in all the official documents in India. You know, interestingly enough, um, the two most significant symbols, even on the Indian flag, are Buddhist symbols. You know, how that happened, I'm not sure, but I think um, it, was Dr. it could have been because of Dr. Ambedkar, but. Um, but it is significant to see that. And and the lions, um, you know, the, the four-headed lions, you don't see the fourth one, is basically the sound of the Dharma going in all four directions. So so this particular symbol was important for us yeah. to bring into <clears throat> this, you know, sort of root the murals in Sadhana, where this particular artifact was also discovered. So you can actually right. see it in the museum at Sarma, the actual column. So then this, these two characters, this is the Buddha's wife, you know, and she is, you know, um, you know, he, he, she, this, these are his attachments that he leaves. And this was his friend Chandaka. Uh, and they were the ones who left together. You know, so that's why we placed him right at the stairs so that, you know, um, you would have that sense of him going out. And then around uh, this panel, you have, you know, the banana trees, which are a symbol of the hollowness of life because they look like a tree, but they are hollow inside. So they depict samsara. So... I have an interesting story on this one. Um, we had um, an artist from Kerala and uh, he was Christian and he used to go next door to pray every day that he would do a good job painting the life of the Buddha. You know, yeah, That was his, his goal. But he was very, very intense and he was from Kerala and he loved to paint... Um, banana trees because bananas are you know huge in Kerala it's the, one of their largest um, uh, you know trees that grow there so there was another panel on the side of here where I had asked him to paint a banana tree that was deteriorating you know that the leaves were not perfect and they were falling and they were there was you know a sense of decay in them and, you know, I kept asking him for a good month to paint that tree and he just wouldn't do it. You know, he just wouldn't do it. Yeah. And and I was like, look, I'm, I'm in charge here. You have to paint this tree. And so, and then finally I figured out that there was something that was preventing him from doing it. So I said to him, I said, Jinto, what is it? Why won't you paint this tree? You know, and he says, how can you ask me to paint a decaying tree in a temple to the Buddha. Everything has to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. So then I had to talk to him about impermanence and say, look, you know, the message of the Buddha was impermanence, that everything decays, everything changes, you know, nothing stays the same. I still couldn't convince him till I made an agreement with him that on this particular panel of the palace life, he got to paint the banana trees perfectly with little baby banana trees, perfect That's banana right. trees. And so that I had to negotiate a deal <laughs> to, to get this done. Yeah. It was pretty funny. Um, but you know, it just goes to show that where his heart was, he wanted to do the best, you know. And even though I was his boss, he you know, he was going to go against me. <laughs> But that was a tough negotiation, I can tell you that much. <laughs> so then um, I'm actually going to go to this one. This was actually a panel that we painted last. And in this panel is, you can see this is the Buddha. He's sitting under the Bodhi tree. And this is the army of evil. This is Mara's army. This is Mara. 
So as the Buddha sat under the tree, Mara tried to distract him, you know. These were his daughters, you know, so he tried to distract him with beauty. And then he had his army start attacking the Buddha. I love painting this because all of these figures were painted by the Tibetan artists. So you can see um, this was the one place where we had them painted exactly as they do it in all their bankers. So these are the various, you know, characters of Mara's army. And then we had, um, we actually had the students from BHU paint these marigolds. So you can see the difference in styles. You know, the very stylized form that the Tibetans used and the more realistic form that, you know, the young students of BHU would, uh, were painting. Yeah, and, and this, uh, this really depicts uh, how uh, the Buddha uh, was able to transform all the arrows that were being shot at him into flowers, you know. Yeah, and the symbolism, of course, is there. Um, you know, um, I'm going to take a picture of this one so you can really see it yeah, yeah, better. Yeah. better. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Of course, the symbolism is that, you know, the violence is combated with compassion and uh, he transforms, he transforms right? you know, uh, a negative into a positive. He, he takes he takes the arrows and makes them into flowers. And the reason why we picked the marigold is because the marigold is the flower for all the offerings in India. So in it's all, a the, it's flower. a sacred flower. And if you notice that the color is the same color as the robes of the Buddha. So it's almost as if in his, in his determination and in, in his you know, you can see he's resolute, you know, because once he sat under the tree, he said he wasn't going to get up till he was enlightened, you know. And uh, so Mara asks him, you know, uh, who is going to witness uh, your enlightenment? And he touches the ground and therefore the mudra of the earth is my witness, that the earth is really my witness. Um, to my enlightenment, to, to him becoming, to gaining nirvan. Um, this to me uh, was, you know, it was a very intense experience painting it. It was the last panel that I did. It was the last Buddha image that I painted and uh, oh. over there. And in this particular one, I actually, you can see in his eyes, you know, I actually had this, this, I don't know, it was a quality of completion, I guess, you know, a, a quality of, uh, a knowing quality, I felt, you know. And for me itself, the whole pattern of time was also a learning. You know, I was actually learning about the Buddha as I was painting him, you know. So to paint this as the last thing that I did in the hall um, uh, for the life of the Buddha was significant for me as well, because that journey for me was walking through some sorrow myself, you know, in all its, uh, with all its faces, you know. I mean, within that that hall, we actually experienced all sorts of emotions, you know, because we were we were all in this together, and we all had to deal with all our demons all together in that one space and convert it, leave it behind on the floor, so that whoever walked in there, you know, 
would only have a sense of peace, a sense of conclusion. Um, I hope we achieved it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had to be very careful about uh, maintaining uh, the palette for the the whole uh, temple hall. Uh, and uh, the way we were able to do that was being very, um, very careful about the colors that we used. Uh, and the end result was that uh, when someone walk in, walks in even now, it, it seems as if one person had painted everything. You know, they, they, it doesn't seem as if, you know, there were so many different artists from different countries, uh, from different backgrounds, different religions even, and uh, different faith traditions uh, that were, had been involved in this thing. So you can... I'm, I'm going to show you yeah. all the various people yeah. who were there. So th this this is Emilio. He was from Italy. Uh, that's Kunga. He's Tibetan and Sikkimese. Um, of course, everybody knows also. I don't know. <laughs> uh, these were kids from uh, Banaras Hindu University. No, that's it. Animal back there. I uh, know. Actually, the, they were the ones who were doing um, the the letters on the outside of the temple. They they were a group that came in, I think, from Brazil, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, and you can go to this slide, yeah. This slide actually, sh this, this is Jinto, the one I, I had to persuade to paint. <laughs> uh, 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 the banana trees. He was very good with trees, yeah. and uh, so we had him paint paint the trunk and a lot of the leaves of the tree as well. Of the Bodhi tree, yeah. and this actually shows you uh, at the center how high it was, forty feet. Um, so we were the sky team. There were only three or four people who, who made the journey. Who <laughs> would get up there? <laughs> <laughs> and that's Kaveri, <laughs> and that's uh, Annabelle. Annabelle, yeah. and she's this, from Idaho over here. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and these two local boys, and these two, yeah. Ram and Anil, yeah. We call them the Sky Team. We used to, yeah, we were the Sky Team because nobody else dared go up that high. <laughs> yeah, the, the the highest point up there was about, about 40, forty feet. Forty feet, yeah, yeah. It's quite yeah, high. That's quite high. Um. This this was a very interesting um, occurrence that happened, and it, I think it happens on all of Rinpoche's projects. You know, there's magic really. Um, one day before we'd actually started painting the altar, it was really interesting. Um, this contingent of uh, Thai monks showed up at the door. Nobody knew who they were and why they were there. And this, um, the oldest Thai monk, they say he's over 100, <laughs> and he woke up in the morning and he told his group that to take him to, to, to this institute, you know, he asked them, this is the place I want to go. And they showed up and they said, he's here to bless um, the work. And so Siring was, she says, you know, in all my life, I've I mean, she says, I see all kinds of things, but this one took, took even me aback. So he came here uh, on his own, uh, out of the blue, and he, he, I think he drew a stupa, you know, right there where the tree is marked, and uh, blessed us, blessed us all, and blessed our, <laughs> our brushes and uh, all our instruments. Yeah. And he said, now the work can commence. He just came there all by himself. It was an incredible experience, actually, for us all. Yeah. You know, didn't speak a word to us. He was in complete silence, you know, yeah. and uh, just yeah. went right up to the altar, uh, asked for the brush, and proceeded to make these marks. And then we asked his um, retinue if we could paint over them, and they said, yes, that's what he's doing. He's giving me the permission to do it. So that that was a really 
incredible experience, actually. Um, this shows you how this this was interesting because when we had to draw the the tree, uh, you know, there was no sense of perspective uh, because I couldn't step back. <clears throat> so what TJ did was he actually got on um, to um, he got on to a scaffold right in the middle, and he took his laser pointer and actually went ahead and pointed. And I, I followed his laser pointer and drew the tree. I did it completely blind. I had to have complete faith in what he was pointing at because I had literally no sense of perspective at all. So these are all the various students who showed up. This was one of our sponsors, Annika, um, as you can see. Um, this was, uh, she was from the US, she's Italian. Uh, she was from Japan, Hunga from Tibet, Jinto from Kerala, he was from Nepal. And they all still, these are all BHU students, Bar Banaras Hindu University, it's the local university. Um, Annabelle, she's from Idaho. Um, this, this is a, also a very interesting story. This particular uh, boy, his name was Manoj. And uh, he was a PhD student. Um, and when I first saw his portfolio, I was very, very impressed. And uh, I said, okay, I want this, this boy to be a part of the team. And I had him do something uh, for us. I had him actually run a few of the other students. And, you know, when, when we talk about samsara and, and demons and having a fixed mind, um, he was my best teacher. He really was. So this is right in the beginning when we were first doing the murals. Um, there was, uh, I will actually go back so that I can show you what I'm talking about. Um, this is all this decorative work that we did, which was very pale and very subtle. And I put him in charge thinking that, you know, he was very good uh, representational painter and that he would understand light and shadow and Tromploy, which is a very Western way of doing ornamentation. You know, it's actually European Tromploy. And so uh, I was like, okay, he will be the one who will actually get it. And I will have him do the take the BHU students and work with him. So when he started working on one, um, you know, after a week had gone by and I had, you know, a lot of other things to do, I hadn't noticed what he was doing. And I looked over and I was in horror because everything was painted really bright, extremely shockingly bright, you know? <laughs> and and I had done a section of it, it, how I wanted them to do it, and it looked nothing like the section I had done. So I was furious, you know, I threw everybody out of the hall and, and I locked the doors and I fixed it all. And I said, this is impossible. How am I going to work with all these people? And, you know, this was, I just started doing it. And, and so I fired him. I fired him and I said, please go home. You know, um, you, you haven't done a good job, you know. And, and I continued to work and um, everybody was a little wary of me because you know, I had shut everything down. And so this boy comes back to me and he says, okay, ma'am, I'll leave. But you have to tell me what I did that was wrong. And I said, well, don't you see what you did wrong? You know, because a part of what he had painted was still up. And I kept pointing to it. And I said, don't you see? Don't you see? And he says, no, ma'am, I don't see. You know, and, and I it stopped me for a minute. There's something in his voice that stopped me. And I took him to another part of the murals. And I kept asking him what the colors were. In the end, we realized that he was colorblind. He couldn't see uh, tertiary colors. So he couldn't see the subtle colors that I had painted because he just couldn't see them. 
So he was this amazing painter, but he could not paint in a tertiary palette, you know, which are the more subtle hues. So he just couldn't do it. So I remember I, I felt so bad after that, you know, I felt horrible. And I was like, okay, this is it. I will never have a fixed opinion ever again, you know, because you don't really know what you're dealing with, right? You, you think you do, but it's all a matter of perception. So this boy ended up drawing a large part of the murals. And I used to mix the colors for him and tell him that this was his primary color, this was his secondary, and this was his tertiary. And till and he was the last boy to leave with me. Um, yeah, he was there right till the end. Right till the end. <clears throat> and he's now a very, not, I don't know if he's, but a very successful um, animator in Bombay. And when he left um, the hall, he told me, he says, there's nothing in this world that I can't do anymore. And he, you know, worked it all out, you know. He used to yell across the room to me and say, ma'am, can you come and harmonize my colors? Yeah, I <laughs> you know, that. Yeah. And I used to say, yes, yes, no problem. You know? But he actually drew most of the lotuses all around the hall. Yeah. yeah. You know, so so we, we ended we up had him, using. We had him draw them all in with the chalk and then we, the other artists would paint them in. Um, this one, I think this is the last slide we, we'll talk about, and then let's just open it up for questions. It's a, um, this, this, <laughs> this is another uh, young boy who had this connection with animals, you know, animals and birds. So I used to have him paint animals and birds. And uh, his story was really interesting. I used to save all the really fun animals for him to paint. Because he used to ask, come to me and say, ma'am, can I paint the animals? And I'm like, yes, yes, you can paint the animals, you know. And so I had saved the peacock for him on the birth panel. And, um, you know, and he just didn't show up to work. And so both Tija and I, you know, we kept waiting, we kept waiting for him to show up and he didn't show up to paint the peacock. And then we thought, you know, we don't know. We kept asking everybody what happened, what happened. Nobody could tell us what happened to this young boy. So in any case, you know, I had uh, the Carolite boy who was kind of like my pseudo general who kept saying, we are running out of time. I have to paint the peacock. So, so he went ahead and painted the peacock on the birth panel. And then the next week, or I think two weeks later, this boy shows up. And so I said, look, I, I don't have the peacock for you to paint anymore, but you can paint the white peacock on the panel of the Mahapari Nirvan. And uh, when I told him that, he started crying, you know. And I said, what happened? The reason he had disappeared was because he his younger brother had died from of the flu, you know, lack of medicine in the village that they lived in. And his younger brother, who was 16, had just passed away. And uh, it was interesting, the sense of timing, that he ended up painting not the birth panel peacock, but the peacock of sorrow, you know, on the panel of Mahapari Nirvan. And uh, he was a very interesting boy, you know, because when you know they were all asked to write us letters as to what it meant for them to paint in uh, you know the murals and so the, you know we got letters thanking us thanking Sereen thanking Rinpoche everybody under the sun you know yeah. we got all these lovely letters except from this boy this boy thanked the Buddha and I was always taken aback you know uh, by him he was only 18 or 19 you know, and so the last thing, the last, um, I guess the last element that was left to paint out of the animals was this little kingfisher, you know, and he he was itching to paint it, you know, so, and usually I would direct him and I would say, okay, you know, you put this here, do this here, 
this one I said, you know, here's the Kingfisher. You get to paint it anywhere in this hall, wherever you feel, wherever your heart desires, you can go ahead and paint it. Yeah. And he painted it right on the altar, <laughs> facing the Buddha. On this, yeah. this little perfect placement, you know, really. For him and his, you know, so I always call it the little kingfisher of suffering, you know, because this boy came through it, you know, and he ended up, the last thing he painted was this kingfisher. <laughs> so I think on that I'll end. And maybe open it up for questions. That's all. Thank you so much. It's so, so inspiring and beautiful and touching. It's really, you made me speechless. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's so, so much. beautiful and inspiring. If I may ask if you can uh, tell a little bit more about the panel with the peacock and the deal, it's also so beautiful and inspiring and special. What, uh, what it's that? Could you repeat that? Uh, about the panel with the peacock. Oh, about the, the peacock uh, uh, on the Mahaparinirvan? Yes. Yes, and, and, and the deal. And the deer. Um, well, uh, I see. Well, the peacock on the Mahaparin one, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to find it. Um, I don't see. You maybe, see yeah, yeah. So you can see it here, right on the bottom. Um, you can see the white peacock. You see the white peacock. So the reason what in India, when when you lose somebody, you know when 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 there is a death in the family, or you or somebody has died, we all wear white, and the reason we wear white is because the person who has left has taken all the color out of our lives, you know. So so we wanted to paint something on the Mahaparinirvana scene, which was an animal you know, which was not a person, but we wanted the sorrow to be there in every leaf, in every part of that panel, you know. So so we painted the peacock in white, you know, to symbolize the passing of the Buddha, you know, that this was, we were all sitting there in sorrow. So that is really... I couldn't get a better one. We can't get you a better image of that, but... And the deer, yeah, right. the the deer, the deer are very significant because the first sentient beings to hear the Buddha's word were two deer. That's why it's called deer park. That's why um, you know you always have the two deer sitting. You know, and so if you look at um, so we do have deer um, all through because they are considered so auspicious. But even on the throne, um, let's see if I can find one, which is a little clear. Um, I, I don't think I can find one which is clearer, but no problem. We, we we always um, do the deer in any image where, especially if there is a teaching um, panel. So actually, there it is. So you will see the two deer, and you will see the Dharma Chakra in the center, because those were the two first two sentient beings to hear the words of the Dharma. And if you notice, all of these disciples who are sitting around the Buddha you notice how specific the feet are. And this was something that TJ photographed the monks uh, sitting in these particular ways and then we, we painted them in. So these are actually real monks whom we, we painted in. Painted and uh, the way they sit signifies that they're listening to the teaching. So that specific way of sitting is really that they are listening. Yeah, the transmission. Yeah. That, yeah. that the transmission 
of the Dharma is happening. Mm -hmm. so. Wonderful, thank you. I, I see that uh, Usha would like to ask something, so please. First of all, I would like to say thank you, Kaveri. It was absolutely beautiful, very amazing. I must con confess that I was in two minds. Uh, I don't have so much interest in drawings and murals and I mean so much. I wonder, but something compelled me to join and I'm so happy. I'm so happy that I have uh, joined this session. It has changed my perspective. I'm born and brought up in Bombay. So I know a lot about what you spoke and the entire depth went straight back and hit back home. And uh, even though I have heard and I have, I mean, Buddha was part of our culture and uh, uh, read about him. I had even painted, a, I mean, it's shocking to say, but I had actually done a small painting on Buddha in my room. Oh. I had uh, I had put a tracing paper on him sitting on the Bodhi tree, and uh, I had uh, you know just drawn the with my I have not done any drawing, um, but it was part of my one of my uh, class uh, duty. So I had painted uh, this picture, and it came vividly to my mind. I mean. And everybody had appreciated that uh, because it was, I think it was the only time I showed patience by drawing. And uh, the the story and the way you have elaborated it and the murals, I mean, everything just came to life for me. I mean, I have just changed. Uh, I mean, you made a big, uh, it's beautiful. I mean, and so and it's Khak was there with you means I feel uh, you have actually experienced the aura and the and the story about the man that came to bless. It just bowled me over. I mean, I'm just. I think you are blessed. <laughs> I, thank I, you so much. I definitely feel that. Every and day. I really, I really thank Itzhak for uh, sending me the link and I have joined. I mean, yeah, we are so happy he, he did that. It's it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will be having to leave a little bit early. So I'll just wait for some time and just say my final, not final, whatever. Thank you so much, Kaveri. You're from where? I didn't understand. Uh, I grew up uh, in uh, all over India, but my father was from Punjab and my okay. mother's from UP. Okay. But we lived in New Delhi, a large part, in Bombay too. All over, really. Yeah, and now, now we live in Los Angeles. Now we live in Los Angeles. That's what I was wondering. You're saying morning, so I was wondering. It's not morning yes. in India. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Currently, yeah. we live. Uh, I would like to say a, a big, a big thank you for this amazing uh, uh, presentation, the amazing story, and. And um, it brought me back to the time I was with the park there, uh, which was also an amazing experience with uh, all the atmosphere of the um, uh, doing. You know, it was in the middle of doing. Or yes. Actually, I didn't uh, see it complete because we were just in the middle of the, of the creation of the whole thing. And yeah. it is really beautiful, so beautiful. And the way you, uh, uh, both of you presented it uh, was very nice and very uh, personal, but also including everything. So thank you very much. It was really nice. You're very welcome. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. <laughs> Do you plan to come to pray to paint something like this in Israel? <laughs> <Yes>. Anytime. <laughs> I will be happy to meet you. <laughs> yes. As will we. As will we, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I think the message of the Buddha 
is still alive. <laughs> it is. Oh, it is. The way you said about stillness and peace, peace of course, it's a very general word which nowadays everybody is using. Um, but that word stillness and the and the the murals which I saw and the pictures and actually it showed. I mean, I felt it. I felt that feeling of stillness. Like, I mean, I have to f work on it, but. It gave me the message. So we all have to work on it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think it's equal opportunity, <laughs> agitation in all our minds. Yeah. It's a, a, a TJ and Kaveri, they sent a, the, a part of, from a book that uh, Seren wrote about her project from 2002 to 2020. And this is amazing what uh, what she did, and part of this is the it's the sacred murals. So I will share it. So uh, so if you want, there are uh, people here that are participated. I don't know. So if you want, uh, please share me. Uh, please send on the chat your email address, and I will send you this. It's it's a very beautiful part that sharing with Kaveri, the describing the work and the concept and the ideas. Uh, behind the second mules, and it's uh, and I seem to have this energy, this beauty, these feelings from the second mule in this period that we are in. It's really a healing process. It's really a reminder of another opportunity, another options, another realm. So, and it's so it's really wonderful. And I want also to mention that a uh, uh, sharing that I. After I ask uh, uh, Kaveri and TJ if they are willing to, to share, and they so kindly and with infinite generosity, they say yes. And uh, we felt that we need to ask sharing permissions. And she was so kind, so open, of course, of course, and do it very open and no obligation. So it's the blessing of the murals is just flowing through all people around it. So thank you so much. It's such a gift. Oh, you're very welcome. Very welcome. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Each story had a meaning. Behind each story, there was a meaning about the boy who lost his brother, about mm -hmm. the, uh, the Kerala person who did not want to draw the decayed banana. I mean, each story behind the making of the mural also has an, uh, some message to give. I mean, it was really very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of these um, young kids, you know, it was the first time that they had actually done something um, where they had been a part of something, you know, they'd only learned about it in their classroom. They hadn't actually done anything like this you know yeah. so some of them had never been on a scaffold or one of the guys you know he was so scared to get up to 22 feet we had to tie him with a rope and tell him that when the rope is tight that means you can't go back anymore you know? so there was they all I mean and to see them all actually um progress and and get so strong and so much confidence in themselves, you know. That's really what Rinpoche teaches us also is to have that inner confidence, you know, the inner confidence of being able to do, you know. And and for them I could see the changes actually happening in front of me. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. Was... In fact, some of them even told us that uh, over the few months that they spent with us, they had learned more than they had in six years of college. <laughs> you know? Because they, so, they, got because to, they were actually doing it, you know. They were applying they, it. They were applying it. Applying their knowledge, yeah. 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 They all they all were TJ was the was their favorite. And uh, I was the one who was the disciplinarian. And so they actually, one time I, I canceled their 11 o'clock tea break 
because I thought they were having way too many breaks. And they, I, I had a strike. <laughs> they came with me with a petition to get their tea break back. And the person who was heading the group was TJ. <laughs> well, they all came to me. <laughs> I, I never uh, forgot that. I said, God, I have a revolution on my hands here. All over <laughs> tea. <laughs> yes, because tea is the. I think there's no Indian who does not have tea at least five or six times a day. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. especially strong tea. Right. Yeah. It's, like a, it's like their coffee shot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, but, but TJ anyway. kind of became the the you know the the father, the uncle, the the older brother, or whatever. He was really there the person that they would go to for care and they still they're getting married and they have children and they still yeah they're they, they keep, keep in, in touch, touch with us, with us yes. and tell Absolutely. us what they're doing yeah. 10 years later yeah. even like, well, like something so. amazing thank you so much i must take leave thank you it's okay. bye-bye thank, bye -bye. Bye -bye. thank you thank you thank you very much bye-bye Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kaveri. Thank you, TJ. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rinpoche. And of course. Uh, we keep in touch and we yes. see how it's really fun. Thank yes. you so much. You're so welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.